Today we're going to be talking about complex trigonometric functions. And the starting point is pretty simple. We're going to start off with Euler formula. That is, we know that e to the i phi equals the cosine of phi plus i times the sine of phi. And we know that if we replace phi by negative phi, then we get the cosine of phi minus i times the sine of phi. So we have a couple of equations over here that we can solve for the cosine and sine functions. So this implies on adding the equations you can solve for cosine, so you get cosine phi equal to e to the i phi plus e to the negative i phi divided by 2, and subtracting them will yield the sine function. So you'll have the sine of phi be equal to e to the i phi minus e to the negative i phi divided by 2, but bear in mind there's this i being multiplied by the sine as well, so I'm just going to shift it to the other side and get this expression. So these two equations express the sine and cosine functions in terms of the complex exponential. So we can generalize this because we know exactly what a complex exponential e to the z is. So using these equations, we can define the cosine of a complex number z as e to the i z plus e to the negative i z divided by 2, and the sine of a complex number z as e to the i z minus e to the negative i z divided by 2 times i. And once you know what sine and cosine look like for all complex numbers z, you've basically unlocked the trigonometric skin for complex analysis, whereby you define the other trigonometric ratios in exactly the same way. For example, the tangent of z being sine z by cosine z, and the same old definitions for the secant and cosecant functions. Another nice thing here is that you can easily verify using these definitions that the trigonometric identities we know all hold in the complex realm too. For example, you can verify that the squared sine of z plus the squared cosine of z equals 1 for all complex numbers using these definitions we have. And that, of course, is left as a little exercise to you, the viewer. Now, the complex trigonometric functions are very closely related to the complex hyperbolic trig functions. And how exactly are they related? Well, let me show you in a very cool way. So let me take the cosine of z, that is e to the i z, plus e to the negative i z, divided by 2, and perform a transformation from the z realm to the i z realm. So in that case, I get cosine i z equal to e to the i times i z, which of course is e to the i squared z, and i squared is just negative 1, so we have e to the negative z, plus e to the z divided by 2. Now, pause at the structure and take a moment to recall exactly how we defined the hyperbolic cosine. So, cosh x is defined as e to the x plus e to the negative x by 2. So, keeping with the structure for our complex valued hyperbolic function, we see that the cosine of i times z equals the cosh of z, which is a pretty cool relation. Similarly, we can figure out the relation between the sine and the hyperbolic sine, or the sint of z. So sine z equals e to the i z minus e to the i z divided by 2i. Again, the same transformation from the z realm to the i z realm gives us e to the negative z minus e to the z divided by 2 times i. Now, division by i is the same as multiplication by negative i. So that means I can write this as e to the z minus e to the negative z, where I switched up the order in the numerator to get rid of this extra negative sign that I would have introduced. And we have to divide this by 2 and multiply by i. Now, this looks exactly how the sinh function should be defined, recalling its definition from the real realm. So we have the sine of i times z being equal to i times the sinh of z. And both of these equations, the ones for uh, the cosh and the sinh functions, 
implies that the hyperbolic tangent, uh, the tangent of IZ equals I times the hyperbolic tangent of Z. Now this link up of circular and hyperbolic trigonometric functions is pretty cool, but it's not the only way in which the complex trigonometric functions set themselves apart from their real valued counterparts. Another marked distinction is the fact that the complex trig functions are not bounded. Now bear in mind, we're talking about complex valued functions here. So if I say that f of z is bounded, I mean its absolute value is bounded. So the complex trig functions are not bounded, as in if I were to write an equation like sine x equal to 2, and I were to task everyone with finding a real number that satisfies this equation, that's not going to happen. It's invalid. In the real realm, that is. However, in the complex realm, it's quite easy to find a complex number z satisfying this equation. And how are we going to do that? Let me give you a nice demonstration. We have e to the i z minus e to the negative i z divided by 2i equal to 2. So this implies that we have e to the i z minus e to the negative i z equal to 4 times i. So expanding using e to the i z would give us a very nice structure. It would give us e to the 2 i z. Wait, let me just fix that. Yeah, much better. Minus 4 i times e to the i z minus 1 equal to 0, which is a quadratic equation in e to the i z. And we can solve this using the quadratic formula as e to the i z being equal to 4 i plus or minus square root. The square of 4 i is negative 16 minus, but we got a plus sign now, and 4. Yeah, that's right. Divided by 2. So what we get is 4 i plus or minus negative 12 in the square root basically means i times 12 divided by 2. So we have 2 i plus or minus this 12 can be the square root 12 can be written as 2 times root 3, right? So we have i times root 3 as well, and this equals e to the i z. Now to get z, we can use logarithms. So using the complex logarithm, we have i z equal to the logarithm of i times 2 plus or minus root 3. And of course, we can expand by 1 by i. So this is a set of complex numbers that satisfies the equation sine of z equals 2. And immediately we see a problem with inverse trigonometric functions in the complex realm. If I were to solve the equation sine of z equals w using the same pattern as before, I would get z equal to 1 by i times the logarithm of i w plus or minus square root 1 minus z squared. So we see a problem here with the logarithm function. This is a multi-valued function. So that means z, which according to this equation, should be defined as the inverse sine of w is not a continuous function. So how do we solve this problem? Well, obviously, we're going to need to define branch cuts. Branch cuts to take care of the logarithm and, of course, specify which branch of the square root function we're using. And to achieve all of that, we're going to need a couple of complex planes. So here's my z plane and w plane. And we transform from z plane to w plane using sine z equals w. Now, let's analyze what happens to the complex numbers in the z plane under the transformation sine z equal to w when I let the imaginary part of z be zero. And why is this so important? Why is this case so important? Well, if the imaginary part is zero, it implies that sine z equals the sine of its real part, x. And the sine of a real number is just the real valued sine function, which we know 
is bound between neg uh, positive and negative 1. So what this means is that the entire real axis in the z-plane is mapped onto the segment of the real axis in the w-plane between negative and positive 1, which is pretty cool. But besides being cool, it gives us some intuitive reasoning as to how our branch cuts should be defined. So a nice way to define them here would be to exclude all those real numbers less than negative 1 and, e and even equal to negative 1 because this is a branch point, so let's just exclude it. And we're also excluding all those real numbers greater than or equal to positive 1. Okay, so those are the branch cuts we needed. And now let's analyze what happens to the strip bound by x equals negative pi by 2 and x equals positive pi by 2. Okay, so we see that the real parts of all complex numbers in here are bound between positive and negative pi by 2, whereas the imaginary part is not bounded. So how does the sine function behave under such circumstances? Well, we have sine z equal to sine of x plus i times y, and we can expand this using the classic formula for sine of one number plus another number. So we're going to have sine x times the cosine of i y plus the sine of i y times the cosine of x, and uh, cosine i y is just the cosh of y, so we have sine x times the cosh of y, plus sine of i y is i times the cinch of y, so we have i times cosine x times the cinch of y. So this implies that the real part of sine z equals sine x times the cosh of y, whereas the real part, uh, whereas the imaginary part of sine z is cosine x times the cinch of y. And while we've bounded x to lie between negative and positive pi by 2, we've left the y variable unhinged. So because we have hyperbolic functions over here, we're going to cover all possible values for the real and imaginary parts in the complex plane. So that means our strip bound between positive and negative pi by 2, this vertical strip is mapped onto the slit plane, mind the branch cuts, it's mapped onto the slit plane defined as the complex plane excluding the interval negative infinity to negative 1, as well as the interval plus 1 to, wait, this one's included, plus 1 to infinity. And of course, I'm going to write this down a lot neater. So what we've done is define the required inverse mapping, z equal to the inverse sine of w. And using the structure we derived earlier, we have inverse sine w equal to 1 by i times now a single-valued logarithm, th thanks to the branch cuts, of i w plus square root 1 minus w squared, where we've invoked the principal value that is the default or positive square root. And this here is a nice continuous function of the complex variable z. And this can be, this has been visualized, this was visualized by us as a mapping that takes the slit plane c excluding negative infinity to negative 1, and also excluding 1 to infinity, onto the vertical strip rez bound between pi by 2 and negative pi by 2. And this was a pretty cool exercise. And I'd like you to perform the same exercise for the cosine function as a bit of homework. And of course, you have additional homework as well. As usual, we have homework from Gamelin's text exercise 1.8, questions 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. You can DM me on Instagram in case you need any help. And don't forget to like and subscribe.
Also, subscribe to my main channel, Maths Bible 5, for extra credit. All links are in the description box. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. Thank you. See you next time.